Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff. This week's story is called The Murder of Lisa Blakey, Lone Kill or Gang Hit. It's by Stuff investigative reporter Martin Van Bainen, who joins me now. Hi, Martin. Hi, Mike. The murder of Lisa Blakey. Let's set this up first of all. Uh, What happened here? Well, Lisa was a 20-year-old from Timaru, and uh, she began hitchhiking to the West Coast from Yaldhurst on February the 6th, 2000, and ended up, unfortunately, dead in the Porter River, which is not too far from Arthur's Pass, in sort of big open country. Um, it, It turned out that Lisa had been strangled and her body was then placed in the water and a boulder was put on her shoulder. So this happened uh, 20 years ago, February 2000. It's not a cold case. This case was solved. Someone was arrested, tried and convicted. Uh, Tell us about that and, and what's happened of late in this case. Well, it took a while for police to arrest the man that would be eventually convicted of Elisa's murder. About a year after her death, they arrested a guy called Timothy David Taylor. Now, there were always some doubts, as there usually are in a circumstantial case like this, and sort of two theories have emerged. So the case is circumstantial, as you say, which is what makes it interesting, this this new theory that's emerged. No one disputes that Tim Taylor picked Lisa up just outside of Christchurch and took her at least some way into Porter's Pass. But where the case gets a bit murky now is exactly what happened, who and when. It's, it's a case that's kind of built on... The details. Yeah, and they're quite complicated details because there are a number of locations, a number of times that um, are quite crucial to either version. So it really does take a lot of work to get your head around around, uh, the case. The reason it's come to attention again is that Taylor's lawyers have applied to the Criminal Cases Review Commission for his case to be reviewed. And the commission hasn't yet decided to take the case on And whether they do investigate is far from certain. Thanks, Martin. Let's take a look at the case then. Here, with some strong language and content, is Martin reading his story, The Murder of Lisa Blakey, Lone Hit or Gang Kill. The Yaldhurst service station on the outskirts of Christchurch is a well-known spot to hitch a ride to the west coast. It's about midday, and a slight young woman with shoulder-length brown hair has her thumb out. For company, she has her dog, Chaos. A pup, really. Part pit bull, part Labrador. And no doubt much else. She is travelling with a large cream suitcase and a plain khaki kit bag. The suitcase contains her teddy bear, pills, soft toys and books on astral travel, palmistry, dreams, Chinese horoscopes, reflexology and witchcraft. A hard-covered exercise book is filled with her poems. A line from one reads, Men's poison running through my veins, caused by a broken heart. The day is cool with sunny spells, and a stiff breeze blows from the south across the Canterbury Plains. The woman is wearing a strapless, tie-dyed, purple mini-dress, pants, and a black woolen jersey. She stands in thick-soled black Doc Martens with a stud in her tongue and a Taurus bull tattooed on the back of her neck. Some motorists driving past feel apprehensive for her. I remember she looked so vulnerable, one later said, because she was so young and very attractive. A curious service station attendant watches the hitchhiker who has bought a chicken roll, a $20 phone charge card and a primo chocolate milk drink from the service station's shop. The next minute, she is gone. Her ride is a gingery-headed man called Timothy David Taylor, just turned 30, who lives in Darfield and is driving a messy, pale yellow 1983 Ford Cortina. The day is Wednesday, February the 2nd, 2000. 
Sometime after 1pm, the young woman goes missing. On Sunday, February the 6th, some visiting American fishermen find the young hitchhiker's body in the Porter River near a lay-by. It's big open country, about 70 minutes' drive from Yorthurst. Her body, face down and facing upstream, is mostly underwater and immediately below a willow tree. A 104 kilogram boulder is on her shoulder and her sunglasses are in the water about 15 metres away. The body is soon identified. She is 20-year-old Lisa Ann Blakey from Timaru. She has been strangled and has seven knife wounds in her left leg. On the day she was hitchhiking, Lisa was on the run. She was headed to Greymouth to meet up with an old boyfriend nicknamed Spaz, who was a member of the Epitaph Riders motorcycle gang. Her idea was to regroup, then head to Nelson and afterwards to Australia to see her mother. Lisa moved frequently and had only recently come back to live in her hometown. The plan was to work at Candy's Brothel in Queenstown and live in Timaru on a week-on, week-off basis. In the short time she had been back in Timaru, she had been drinking heavily and taking pills, mainly appetite suppressants, sleep medication and anti-anxiety drugs. A friend thought she seemed paranoid. On February the 1st, when she was supposed to be back at Candy's, she rang home, upset, crying, saying, They are going to get me. She had broadcast the same fears to several other friends. The brothel Candies was run by the Devil's Henchman gang, and perhaps she meant they were going to force her to go back to work. The night before, she had been parked outside the house of Nathan Williams, a patched henchman with whom she had been in some sort of relationship since Christmas. Williams was a drug dealer and pimp, and Lisa was fed up with him. She wasn't in the henchman's good books, because she had gone to a party put on by a rival gang, the Road Knights. Lisa was outside Williams' house, honking her car horn. Williams had come out and later told police he had told Lisa to come in or fuck off. We are not about to kill a chick because she went to the homos, he would say when he became a suspect. In any event, Lisa felt she needed to get out of town quickly. She had also told a friend she knew enough to put away a few boys for a long time. After Lisa's distressed call home on February the 1st, her father Doug, a railway worker, picked her up from a friend's place and drove her to Christchurch, where she stayed the night with a fellow sex worker. At their parting, Doug told Lisa not to come back to Timaru until she had sorted her life out. She gave him a hug and told him she loved him. She intended to take the bus to Greymouth, but missed it, and on February the 2nd took a taxi to the Yaldhurst hitchhiking point. She arrived just before midday. Timothy David Taylor was found guilty of murdering Lisa after a jury trial in Christchurch in April 2002. He was jailed for life and released under strict conditions in April 2021. He is a difficult man to champion. By December, he had allegedly breached his release conditions by going to Manchester Street and Central Christchurch 13 times to visit sex workers. He was recalled to prison where he waits for another parole hearing. In 2021, Taylor's legal team lodged an application with the Criminal Cases Review Commission to have Taylor's case looked at again. 
The Commission has yet to decide whether it will take it on. Taylor's case is partly spearheaded by Bridget McMenamin, a former detective who worked on the Blakey inquiry and who, disillusioned with the Blakey investigation and others, left the police in 2002. Doug Blakey, Lisa's father, is also convinced Taylor did not kill Lisa. In short, they believe henchmen gang members went after Lisa on February the 2nd and found her near Porter's Pass after Taylor had dropped her off. They killed her and did not deposit her body in the Porter River until several days later. Doug Blakey says the key to allaying his concerns about Taylor's guilt lie with a former henchman, now in Australia, who has eluded a DNA test. Blakey believes there's a good chance the former henchman can be linked to a four centimetre long hair found on Lisa's stomach. The hair was neither hers nor Taylor's. That could blow the case wide open, Doug Blakey says. He reckons the record of calls between henchmen and their contacts shows that they knew Lisa was dead by February the 2nd. He's cagey about some other information which he believes supports the theory. He wants to put it before the commission first. Blakey says Taylor had reasons to be terrified of the henchmen and therefore lied repeatedly to protect himself and others. He took the rap, says Blakey. He was the fall guy. I'm looking for closure. I want to get the guys who did it. Police declined to comment for this article. In the past, they've said they investigated the henchmen intensely for at least six weeks after Lisa's murder, but could not find a connection between the gang and Lisa's death. Although only 20, Lisa had seen much of the underbelly of New Zealand life. Her world was a tangled drama of high-paying sex work, sickness, drinking, drugs, gangs and constant moves. Romantic, and in some ways naive, she hankered after something different, but was in very deep. She loved her family, and kept the more sordid details of her life from them. Lisa liked to go out with white power type gang members. Some said she did it for the status, and that she couldn't make up her mind if she was a biker chick, a hippie, or something else. She started with the lost breed in Nelson, progressed to the Epitaph Riders, had connections in the Road Knights, and ended up with the Devil's Henchmen. None were known for treating women well. Lisa first met Nathan Williams, then 27, around the Christmas before she died. Her contacts at Candy's had mentioned him, and she took a $200 taxi ride from Queenstown to Timaru to find out more. Her friend and fellow sex worker Debbie Wilson was tied up with William's flatmate, another henchman called Matthew Cook. After the Christmas meeting, Lisa and Wilson put their new boyfriends up in a flash Queenstown hotel over the new year. They worked and paid for everything while the men partied. Lisa's life could have been very different. She was bright and did well at school, but after her parents' marriage broke up, she became transient refusing to live at home. She began working in massage parlours, and by Christmas of 1997, only 17, she was living in the bleak, greymouth suburb of Cobden and working as a prostitute from home. When she tried to work as a checkout operator at the local super value, she lasted a day. Her former clients pestered her. She enrolled as an adult student at Greymouth High School in 1998, telling a school counsellor she wanted to give up drugs and prostitution. At Candy's, she was regarded as professional and good at getting money out of clients, but some older sex workers thought she was dizzy. Despite her transient lifestyle, she kept in touch with her family and was close to her stepsister Linda, 
who Lisa worried was going off the rails like she had. Linda would recall that Lisa would read her poems aloud. She would write how her life was such shit and about love hurting so much. By the time Taylor turned 30, he could legitimately be called a wife beater, a rapist, a drug dealer, a burglar, a fraudster, a gambling addict, an armed robber and a thief. But no one had accused the small man with gingery hair and a large swastika tattooed on his chest of murder. Around the time of Lisa's death, he was something of a one-man crime wave. Just before Christmas, he held up the Darfield Hotel with a sawn-off shotgun and kidnapped the barman. He had also been dropping dud checks around town, and in the days after Lisa went missing, he met with his supplier of morphine sulphate tablets to do a drug deal and robbed a lotto shop in Christchurch. Taylor grew up on a farm in Cust in North Canterbury. His schoolmates remember him stealing anything he could lay his hands on. He worked on a fishing boat, married and had three children, but did not see much of them after the marriage broke up in 1996. In the three years before he became a suspect in Lisa's murder, he worked as a labourer, truck driver and sawmill worker. He lost the jobs over thefts and erratic work habits. He was known by his cohorts as a wannabe biker, but not taken seriously. He might act tough, a gang member told police, but at the end of the day, he's a bit of a blouse. He wouldn't be able to kill anyone, even by accident. If an argument developed, you could always count on him not being there. Taylor appeared to have an unusually high sex drive. A previous partner told police he tried to sleep with all her friends. He wanted sex all the time, she said, every day when we were together. Even when in a relationship, Taylor would visit prostitutes on Manchester Street in Christchurch. A sex worker, now deceased, told police she had accompanied him on a drug run when he stopped in the middle of nowhere and threatened to leave her there if she didn't have sex with him. Then they had sex on the bonnet of the car. At the time of Lisa's disappearance, Taylor was living in Darfield with a former member of the Templars motorcycle gang called Ross Hesselwood, a pig hunter with a fearsome reputation. They were close, and their house had a red and black Nazi flag hanging from the ceiling. The day before Lisa's body was found, Hesselwood came to the flat where Taylor was ensconced with his then-girlfriend, Ruth Lewis, and, for reasons that remain unclear, gave him a ferocious hiding. Taylor's blood was splattered up the walls. He spent the night in hospital with head injuries, bruising and a broken left arm. Habitual lying was another of Taylor's character flaws. In interviews with the police about Lisa's murder, he continually changed the story and made up new ones. At his trial in 2002, Justice William Young told the jury, His lying has been so serious and prolific that you can place no reliance on what he says unless it has been corroborated. Taylor and Lewis spent most of their days drinking and playing the pokies. Lewis knew the henchmen Nathan Williams and Matthew Cook and liked them both. On the night Taylor was in hospital, she was in bed with Cook. Hi, Michael Wright here. If you're enjoying this podcast, maybe you'd like to check out one of our others. Collapse is the story of the CTV building, which collapsed in the Christchurch earthquake in 2011, killing 115 people. We have a building on fire with persons trapped that we're trying to get out. It's the story of one tragedy in a city full of them, about how a building went up. It shouldn't have got through council. How it came down. And this level collapsed first. The people who were saved. She went from, I'm going to die, to a realisation, I'm going to live. And the 115 who weren't. This is a grown man in tears, because they couldn't rescue these people. It's also a story about a search for the truth. Why did one unremarkable office building in the central city collapse like no other? 
How did almost two thirds of Christchurch's entire earthquake death toll die in this one building? And most of all, was anyone responsible? Go to stuff.co.nz slash collapse or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If I don't get fire service here soon, they're going to die from the fire. When the police charged Taylor with Lisa's murder about a year after her death, they had done one of the most extensive investigations in New Zealand history. It was certainly one of the biggest files. Taylor was a sexual predator who saw an opportunity when he spotted Lisa hitchhiking, the Crown said at his trial. On his way to Christchurch in the Cortina, the Crown said, Taylor had quickly turned around when he saw Lisa and picked her up. He then drove to the Porter River lay-by where there was a struggle, perhaps because he tried to rape her. He may already have stabbed her seven times in the leg while she was in the car. Lisa escaped and Taylor caught her near where her body was found and strangled her, the Crown said. He then went through her belongings, took the phone charge card and dumped some items in a rubbish bin at a lay-by near the Kowai No. 2 bridge, about 10 minutes' drive from the Porter River. Linking Taylor directly to the murder would not be easy. The police found no forensic link between Lisa's murder and Taylor. No blood traces were found in his car and none of his DNA was found on her body. His fingerprints were not found on any of the items in the bin at the lay-by. The thrust of the defence case at trial was to pour doubt on the allegation Lisa had died on February the 2nd. A later time of death made it highly unlikely that Taylor was the culprit. But certain things were not in Taylor's favour. On the Wednesday Lisa went missing, Taylor was seen halfway up Porter's Pass with a woman in his car. The pass takes traffic over the tallest range, past Lake Linden, and is the first steep climb from the plains towards the Alps. Before apparently heading up Porter's Pass, Taylor and Lisa had stopped at the Springfield garage at two minutes past one where Lisa bought a newspaper, $20 worth of petrol, and a big lighter. It seems likely that Lisa paid for the petrol because Taylor had offered to take her further. On February the 7th, police found a chicken roll wrapper in the rubbish bin at the Kowai 2 lay-by. It looked very much like the wrapper from the roll Lisa bought at the Yulter service station. The find supported Taylor murdering Lisa at the porter of a lay-by and then getting rid of the evidence. Another piece of indisputable information was that Taylor loaded the phone card Lisa bought at the Yaldhurst service station onto his phone at 1.58pm on February the 2nd. He could have done this on Porter's Pass, although coverage was uncertain, or after going over the Kowai 2 bridge towards Darfield. Seemed like a dumb mistake. He had jettisoned Lisa's belongings, but had stupidly kept the phone card and used it. Taylor would say he found the phone card in his car. Support for the Crown case also came from Lisa's stomach contents, which showed identifiable fragments of chicken, grated carrot, lettuce, tomato and beetroot all ingredients of the roll she bought in Yaldhurst. This pointed to Lisa being dead within hours of consuming the roll. Then Taylor acted like a guilty man. He kept lying to the police, repeatedly denying he had given Lisa a lift, and then changing the place where he had dropped her off. He asked his girlfriend to tell police he had been with her during a period including February the 2nd, telling her that he had been up to no good.
Chaos was another piece of the puzzle. The friendly pup was seen about 2pm on February the 2nd, coming towards the Kowai 2 bridge. Lisa would not have abandoned Chaos, so something must have happened shortly before. It fitted with Taylor shoving the dog out of his car on his way to the Porter River lay-by, or on the way back. That Lisa was killed at the Porter River lay-by on February the 2nd by Taylor was supported by other factors. The marks on her body were consistent with a struggle at the river and the injuries to her leg were inflicted close to the time of her death. There were spiky twigs from undergrowth similar to that at the river in her hair and between her legs. Her damaged necklace, sunglasses and can of pepper spray were found near her body. In October 2000, eight months after her murder, Lisa's suitcase and kit bag were found by a water race adjacent to the old West Coast Road. It was a good hiding place, and Taylor knew the area well. Like most circumstantial cases, the Crown case against Taylor was not open and shut. Two crucial witnesses for the defence were Barbara Beckford, then 54, and her friend Helen Chambers. Beckford was the chair of the West Coast Health and Disability Ethics Committee, and on February the 2nd was travelling from Greymouth to Dunedin with Chambers for a bioethics summer school. She had driven the road for more than 20 years. Beckford told police she had seen a young woman with luggage and a dog as she drove past the Kowai 2 lay-by after 2pm probably between 2.10 and 2.15. Beckford was deep in conversation with Chambers, but recalled wondering what on earth the young woman was doing in the middle of nowhere. Chambers thought they had sighted the young woman a bit closer to Christchurch, but otherwise supported Beckford. The sighting, if valid, completely cleared Taylor, because it meant Lisa was still alive after 2pm and not where the police said she was. Then came the odd matter of Lisa's body not being discovered until Sunday morning, about four days after her death on the Crown case. Those four days were a busy time for the West Coast route, due to the coast-to-coast multi-sport event. It started on February the 4th, but most competitors travelled to the start on the West Coast the day before. The Porter River lay-by had multiple visitors. Between the time Lisa went missing and her body's discovery, nine people were in the vicinity of the stream and didn't see her body. Yet, on February the 6th, two fishermen arrived and immediately spotted her. The timing for Taylor to have killed Lisa, arranged her body in the stream and got back to Darfield was tight. On the Crown case... Taylor had to drive from Springfield to the Porter River, struggle with and murder Lisa, arrange her body, remove all evidence from his car and dump some items at the Kowai 2 lay-by, all in about an hour. In addition, if Taylor had been in the stream, either struggling with Lisa or positioning her body in the boulder, he should have had wet clothes when he returned to Darfield. However, there was no evidence of him being wet. Some facts which undermined the police case emerged from the post-mortem on Lisa's body. The stomach contents supported the contention she had eaten the chicken roll about midday and was killed soon after. But samples of tissues taken during the post-mortem, which started about 8.30pm on the day she was found, showed few signs of decomposition. The Crown's own pathologist, estimated the time of the death about 18 to 24 hours before the autopsy, mainly due to the fact rigor mortis was present when the body was found. He didn't exclude February the 2nd as the time of Lisa's death. In about 2015, Taylor decided to come clean. He claimed he saw the henchman in a white Bedford van as he was driving back to Darfield after he dropped Lisa off, at her request, at the Kowai 2 lay-by. 
He claimed she was freaking out about threatening text messages she was receiving and wanted to get out of the car. A Bedford van was parked at the henchman's Timaru pad, but it was not seized or searched by police, who were told it hadn't been drivable since Christmas 1999. Doug Blakey says that might be true, but believes the henchman had another Bedford van. Taylor's latest account would explain Beckford's sighting and suggests Lisa's fears were well-founded. In this new scenario, the henchman either killed Lisa immediately and preserved her body in a chiller, or kept her in a secure place until killing her the day before she was found in the river. Taylor supporters believe her body wasn't dumped immediately because the henchman needed time to set up alibis. This new account has certain problems, aside from the fact Taylor is an inveterate liar. For a start, Lisa did not receive any text messages after 2am on February the 2nd. If the sighting of Taylor on Porter's Pass is reliable, he did not turn around after dropping Lisa at the Kowai 2 lay-by. And how could he recognise and name henchmen he did not previously know? Bank transactions, telephone records and medical appointments point to the henchman accused by Taylor being in Timaru on February the 1st and 3rd. Calls were made to their address on February the 2nd and were answered. And why would the henchman, hardly inconspicuous people, use a distinctive vehicle which could be traced back to them, return to the Porter River area to dispose of Lisa's body at a time when the area was crawling with coast-to-coast traffic? Although there were numerous sightings of a similar white van in the area at the relevant times, police following up the sightings found no evidence supporting a scenario the henchmen were involved. However, the henchmen Taylor identified were definitely in Christchurch on February the 5th when they went to the Latimer's Hotel about 3pm and paid cash for a room. They left about an hour later, saying a Dunedin woman, or women, they had arranged to meet hadn't turned up. It suggested they had Lisa's body with them. These will be matters the Criminal Cases Review Commission will consider in deciding whether its scarce resources should be used to look into Taylor's new story. It seems like a big ask, but maybe the information Doug Blakey claims to be holding back will be highly persuasive. The Commission will be looking for new information showing the henchmen were in Christchurch on February the 2nd and knew where Lisa was heading. This is a murky case, populated by people who do not habitually tell the truth. Those that want to tell the truth may be too frightened to come forward. If the Commission does decide to investigate Taylor's new claims, it will have its hands full. That was The Murder of Lisa Blakey. Lone Kill or Gang Hit on The Long Read from Stuff. Written and read by Martin Van Banen and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was mixed by Sam Scannell. Stuff's podcast director is Adam Dudding. If you listened via our website, you can hear this story and more like it on The Long Read podcast, available on all the usual platforms. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening.